All right, this is a series on Christ's messages to the seven churches of Revelation. And earlier this year, we took a trip, research trip to Turkey in May 2008 to visit the sites of those ancient cities. Myself, Pastor David Brown from Milwaukee, and Brian Snyder. It was a tremendously enlightening trip, those churches that Christ addressed in Revelation in those days existed in the Asian province of the Roman Empire. Here we have a map of, of Asia and northern Africa, and the colored areas indicate the old Roman Empire, and the province of Asia was at the heart of the Roman Empire. And those seven churches were located near one another in sort of a crescent and when John was writing to, him, to them on the Isle of Patmos, he was on the island on the Aegean Sea, just off the coast of, of Asia, not far from the churches that he was writing to. That area later became part of the Byzantine Empire and had its capital of Constantinople. The ruins of the churches that you see there today are the old Greek Orthodox or Roman Catholic churches uh, from the period after the Apostles. The ruins here are St. John's Basilica near Ephesus. And something that interested me in those ruins was the old baptistry. And you can see that it was almost waist deep on me. The only reason you would need a baptistry like that would be for immersion. We know that baptism, biblical baptism, is by immersion. It pictures the burial, the death, burial, and the resurrection of Christ until the Roman Catholic Church corrupted it and turned it into infant baptism. But in the 15th century, the Muslims conquered Constantinople. It became the headquarters of the Ottoman Empire. Today, Constantinople is Istanbul and uh, the capital of the modern state of Turkey. And although Turkey is a democracy and has religious liberty as part of his constitution, the majority are Muslims and the Christians are persecuted there. Only recently, a Christian bookstore owner and two of his workers were murdered in cold blood uh, there in Turkey. The mosques are everywhere. The call to prayer you can hear going out across the cities, even in the middle of the night. We saw the whirling dervishes, which is a part of the mystical, it's a little mystical cult of Islam. And they, they go into sort of a trance as they twirl around, channeling, they think, uh, this mystical power from God to man. They hold one palm up and they hold one palm down and they think they're channeling this mystical power. And it's, it is one of the uh, aspects of the mysticism that is bringing all of the religions together today. The countryside of western Turkey, where those churches were located, is beautiful. There's rolling hills, small mountains. It's one of the agricultural bread baskets of, of Europe today. Beautiful rivers and the Aegean Sea there off the coast. They still grow many of the things that they grew in the days of John as he was writing the book of Revelation. The olive oil and the wine are still two of the major exports. You can see the olive trees and the, the vast vineyards there. And it's a great sheep farming country. It's the home of the Agora wool and gore wool and sheep and goats and the shepherds on the hillsides are common sites. Today, it would have looked exactly the same in John's day. Turkey is an interesting mixture of the old and the new. You have modern farming right alongside the hand-operated uh, hand farms that use horses and donkeys and buggies and wagons and hand sickles, the same kind of farming that would have been done back in the days of the apostles. When Revelation was written, Asia, as a province of the Roman Empire, was a peaceful, prosperous place. 
It lay at the heart of the empire. Modern roads connected the cities, paved roads. The bandits and the pirates were under control. It was peaceful. Public works were massive. They had an efficient financial banking system. Coins were in common use. Business opportunities were great. People had traveled extensively for business and for pleasure. Public entertainment was provided in the form of plays and concerts and gladiatorial fights and orations. And the thing that impressed us on this trip was the archaeological excavations from the Roman period, especially at Aphrodisius, Pergamum, Hierapolis, Laodicea, and Ephesus. And you get a great feeling for how things were in those days, and the living conditions and the traveling conditions. The aqueduct systems that brought water into the cities from long distances. There were three aqueducts that provided water for Pergamos. One of those was 50 miles long, and portions of it are still standing today. The gates to the cities were very impressive, and uh, some of them still stand today. They've been recovered, such as these at Ephesus. The gate to Hierapolis. Hierapolis is mentioned in the book of Acts. This was the gate into the market area in Ephesus. And the paved avenues that ran down through the cities, lined with the marble columns, they were colonnaded, and uh, shops along the side, and, and, and sometimes they were uh, lit at night with lamps. Paul would have walked on these very roads, on these very pavements, as he traveled and preached the gospel. Here's the marble way in Ephesus and the Arcadian way in Ephesus leading out of the city out toward the Aegean Sea. This is an artistic rendering of what it would have looked like in those days, very splendid, very elaborate. The Frontina Street in Hierapolis. This is an ancient street of Laodicea. There were colonnaded porticos that uh, led to uh, some of the government buildings and stadiums. This is one in Aphrodisius. Broad market areas that they called agoras that were surrounded with these marble columns and elaborate statues. Here's some of the columns that surrounded the agora in Ephesus. Elaborate monuments. And beautiful fountains. These are the ruins of the water palace in Ephesus. And this is an artistic rendering of what that would have looked like with the flowing, constantly flowing water and a reservoir there that they used to pipe water throughout the city. Very modern, the Roman Empire. The Trajan Fountain in Ephesus. Some of the streets were paved with, with uh, mosaics. And tiles, very intricate designs, and they're still there, there today. You can see some of them. Here's some tiles around a fountain in Aphrodisius and the mosaic pavement in Ephesus that ran along in front of where the smil uh, silversmiths worked, lived. They had public baths in all of the major cities, places for socializing and they were richly ornamented, and they provided water at various temperatures. They had cold water sections, warm water sections, hot water sections, uh, all provided by a system of piping, furnaces to heat the water. They even had public toilets. Uh, this is one at Ephesus that could seat up to 50 people at one time. The problem was you didn't have a lot of privacy. Magnificent libraries. This is the facade of the library at Ephesus and a two-story building. The Celsian Library at Ephesus and the gymnasiums were used for athletic training, for education, for socializing. Very elaborate buildings. The one at Sardis had a hundred columns on the front facade. They had uh, small theaters inside, rich ornamentation, 
rare marble statues, mosaics, fountains. The theaters and the stadiums were very impressive. They held plays and concerts and orations, festivals to their gods, gladiatorial competitions, wild animal fights. Condemned criminals were put to death in those, in those stadiums and theaters. Thrown to wild beasts, Christians were tormented and put to death in public spectacles in those stadiums. The one at Ephesus held 25,000 spectators. And there was a three-story marble stage in the front that acted as a sounding board and so that the speakers speaking in a normal voice down in the front could be heard throughout the theater. The theater at Aphrodisius seated 7,000, and it also had a three-story marble stage in the front, which no longer exists. The theater at Hierapolis seated 20,000, and it's, it, it's used today for certain events. The por performance area could be flooded with water and they staged little mock miniature naval battles there. The theater at Pergamos, built on the side of that steep hill, could see 10,000. Very impressive stadium. And the stadium at Aphrodisius was oval shaped. The stadiums were oval shaped. The theaters were like the ones we just saw, but the stadium at Aphrodisius was about 300 yards long and had a capacity of 30,000, massive stadium, primarily used for sporting events like races, long jumping, wrestling, discus, javelin throwing, gladiatorial contests. They would fight to the death in those contests. After the gladiators saluted the emperor, they said, Hail Caesar, we who are about to die salute you. In the Ephesus Museum, there were some of the inscriptions from the tombs of gladiators. One died at age 23. He had survived eight fights and died during the ninth. One died at age 27. He survived 15 fights and died during the 16th. One was age 30. He had survived 34 fights. He had four defeats, but he was always pardoned by the emperor, whoever was in charge there. The cities also had small theaters for political assemblies and other events. The wealthy people were buried in stone or marble caskets called sarcophagus. In Hierapolis, there are hundreds of those out across the hillside there, those ancient caskets. But the cities of the Roman Empire were given over to idolatry. Everywhere there were the statutes to the gods and goddesses that the people were devoted to, like Zeus, Hermes, Apollos, Athena, Pan, and Fortune. And Aphrodite, Artemis, who was also called Diana, and Isis, and these were some of the mother gods, mother goddesses that had originated from the Tower of Babel and spread throughout the ancient world. In the museum at Aphrodisius, there's a section devoted to those mother goddesses. And we know that this is where Rome got its Madonna and child. There's nothing in the Bible about venerating Mary. There's nothing about uh, 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 depicting Jesus as a perpetual little baby. But it was borrowed from the pagans and from the idolatrous systems that surrounded them in those days. Here is Isis and Horus from a museum in Europe. And here on the right is Mary and Jesus. On the left is Tiki, or the goddess of good luck with her little baby. And there... On the right is Mary and Jesus. Some of the old temples, the ancient pagan temples, have been partially restored, like the temple of Artemis at Sardis, the temple of Aphrodite at Aphrodisius, the temple of Diana that stood at Ephesus was one of the seven wonders of the, of the world. 
took 220 years to build, stood at the head of the harbor in those days. The harbor has receded back because of silting, and no longer is it that particular point, but in those days it stood right there on the harbor. Very impressive building devoted to this pagan goddess. The coins of the city featured uh, depictions of Diana. The city was devoted to Diana. Dionysius temple at Pergamos. The ruins of the Athena temple at Pergamos. The Trajan temple, emperor worship. And Pergamos, their chief god was Zeus, or Jupiter. And they had a beautiful altar to Zeus that was world-renowned, 40 feet high. And in the 19th century, some Germans excavated that and took it back to Berlin and set it back up. This, was, this is what it would have looked like in the columns reconstructed in the Berlin Museum, the altar of Zeus, temple of Julius Claudius. They had emperor worship. The cult of the emperors, the imperial cult, they called it. And the citizens were required in certain festivals to, to, to worship the emperor, to honor him as God. And this is one of the things that got the Christians in trouble and brought the persecution of the empire down upon them when they refused to honor the emperor as God. We saw the ruins of a synagogue, an ancient Jewish synagogue. This is the largest synagogue that's ever been excavated. It was very beautiful and elaborate. There was a fountain at the entrance hall. The main hall was thought to have had a capacity of a thousand. There were mosaics covering the floor, tiles, beautiful intricate tiles, uh, marble inlays decorating the walls. And there was a throne, one for Moses and one for Elijah, representing, of course, the law and the prophets and thrones in those synagogues. And those, of course, pointed to Jesus Christ, but the Jews when Jesus the Messiah came, rejected him. We were able to see the, the situation in which those churches existed in that day. Here's the beautiful harbor at Ephesus, which, which made it a commercial powerhouse in those days and tempted the believers to lose their first love. Pergamos, the town was built at the foot of a, a small mountain and on the top was the Acropolis. It was a fortified area, and that's where most of the temples were built. And there, overlooking them, was that center of idolatry and uh, Satanism. And it was from there that their persecution came. Jesus said it was the seat of Satan. And this is looking from the top of the Acropolis down to the ancient city of Pergamos down below where the church would have been, in the homes. And Jesus said, I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. And thou holdest fast my name and hast not denied my faith. Even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. Pergamos was where parchment was invented. Parchment is writing material made from the skins of animals, especially sheep that they raised in that area. And at Pergamos, at a museum, I purchased a piece of parchment. They used that to write scriptures on. In Laodicea, Jesus rebuked their lukewarmness. And it's interesting that Laodicea's water even was lukewarm. The water in Hierapolis, which is not far from there, was hot. And the water from other area, other cities nearby was refreshing and cold, but Laodicea's water was nasty, they say, and was lukewarm. It was brought from quite a distance into the city. And the travertine deposits at Hierapolis. Hierapolis is, is visible from Laodicea. It's quite near. 
And you can see Hierapolis very easily because you can see the travertine deposits up on that hill, deposited by the minerals from the water as it flowed and flowed over the centuries. It's very beautiful. The water is, is perfectly blue, reflected from the sky, but these brilliant white travertine deposits, and travertine it becomes a very hard material, and it was used in ancient Rome for, as, for building material. It, 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 Rome was filled with travertine. At Ephesus, they have recovered the living quarters of the silversmiths. And of course, that's, that's how Paul got in trouble. The silversmiths were afraid that their income was threatened because Paul was preaching Christ. People were turning to Christ, burning their magic books and throwing away their idols to Diana. And the silversmiths were afraid that they were going to lose their livelihood. And so they caused a ruckus in the theater there. The Bible says in Acts chapter 19 that a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, which made silver shrines for Diana, brought no small gain unto the craftsmen, whom he called together with the workmen of like occupation and said, Sirs, ye know that by this craft we have our wealth. Moreover, you see and hear that not a uh, not alone at Ephesus, but almost throughout all Asia, this Paul hath persuaded and turned away much people, saying that they be no gods which are made with hands, so that not only this our craft is in danger to be set at naught, but also that the temple of the great goddess Diana should be despi despised, and her magnificence should be destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worshipeth. He's referring there to the magnificence of that great temple at Ephesus, one of the seven wonders of the world. And they gathered together at the theater that still exists there in Ephesus and condemned Paul and exalted Diana. The whole city was filled with confusion, the Bible says, having caught Gaius and uh, Aristarchus, men of Macedonia, Paul's companions in travel. They rushed with one accord into the theater. And there it is. This is looking at the theater from a distance from the boulevard that ran out of Ephesus down toward the Aegean Sea. And there's where they condemned Paul. We were reminded of many important lessons on that trip. We were reminded that life is short. The Roman Empire and its glory was there, and it must have been so impressive to men of this world. And yet it's gone today. All of the buildings have collapsed. The glory is gone, reminding us that this world is passing away. The glory of America, the glory of this present world will soon be passed. We were reminded that the Bible is an accurate historical record. Unlike most religious writings, like the Mormon writings, they can't find any evidence that any of that ever happened in North America. Or the Hindu writings, there's no evidence that any of that ever happened, it's myths. But the Bible is an historical record and the places and the events that are described there can be seen today. We were reminded that God's word is true and eternal and that Christ is the only savior. We were reminded that apostasy is the chief characteristic of this age. All of those churches that Jesus addressed in Revelation quickly became apostate. They turned away from the faith and they turned to fables, and they turned to man-made traditions. And that Bible warns that that is, that is the course of this age. And the Bible warns that true churches can only stand and remain sound if they're vigilant, on guard, alert. So it was a very enlightening trip, setting the stage for the messages we're going to present this week. Christ's messages to these seven churches.